All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a f packed room, so that's always a good sign. Hopefully, by the time I'm finished, uh, everybody's still here. It's the last talk of the day, so you probably had a lot of content um, coming at you already. Um, so I'm going to try to keep it interesting enough for you. I'm going to try to keep it light. But it's security, so it's important. Um, so hopefully, you'll at least take uh, home a few key messages here. Maybe before we start, who here? Um, does not know what Angular is or how it works. All right, nobody. That's uh, a good sign. Um, so I have like a very short Angular introduction, but I'm going to skip most of it uh, since everybody is familiar with how it works. Then we can dive right into the uh, interesting details. So what's important with Angular applications is instead of um, having an application that runs on the server, um, you essentially have um, an application that's downloaded in the browser and actually runs in the browser. So you have static code being loaded in the browser. Um, the application is booted. The application does something. And when it needs data or needs to perform actions, it's going to contact an API. It's going to fetch some data and going to insert that into, um, into a template using data binding. And that's essentially uh, very new compared to traditional applications, such as a PHP or JSP application, which does everything on the server. As you will see in this presentation, this means that uh, some, some of the security features that we're used to be, uh, have, are used to perform um, on the server will move to the client as well. And that's something you need to keep in mind. You need to be aware of when you develop this kind of applications. A very brief word about um, what I do. Um, I'm actually a trainer, uh, and I, I actually help people build secure applications. So I'm a web security expert. I did a PhD on web security. And since then, I've been running a training program and doing security assessments for uh, companies uh, who need actual, uh, well, who need help building more secure applications. Uh, I'm also responsible for the secadev.org course, um, which is a, a yearly course which runs in Belgium. Uh, it's a one-week course uh, where we teach uh, security towards developers. We have people from all over the world coming to teach in this course about cryptography, web security, uh, threat modeling, uh, things like that. So if you're interested in that, definitely check it out. But let's talk about security. Let's talk about one of the major problems in web applications and also uh, potentially a major problem in Angular applications, cross-site scripting. You all probably have kind of a feeling what cross-site scripting means. Um, well, a very brief example, if you have uh, something on your website that uh, takes input and somebody enters something like that and that happens, you're in trouble. And this seems like a very simple example, uh, but uh, I read some, some news, posts, uh, news posts yesterday that uh, websites still have have this. I think uh, Drupal had one of these uh, cross-site scripting problems uh, fixed yesterday evening. So yes, this thing exists. It used to be JavaScript um, in insertion, uh, the injection of JavaScript, but nowadays we also have the injection of CSS, HTML, uh, SVG, and everything essentially you can think of. As you can see here, cross-site scripting is often uh, shown as with, with a pop-up. Like, uh, look, I can show you this uh, really annoying alert dialog. Um, oh my god, this is so dangerous. This is a proof of concept. Uh, actually, once you can do this, you can do anything you want within the context of the page. And there's a framework called Beef, the browser exploitation framework, that actually offers this uh, as a feature. So uh, you can insert a very small piece of JavaScript into the user's browser through a cross-site scripting attack. And then uh, the browser connects back to this command center where you can simply launch commands. They have like 300 modules that you can simply execute in the user's browser. Does the website have permissions to access the webcam? No problem. Beef can uh, execute one of these commands to grab images from the webcam, just like that. You can grab screenshots from the page. You can uh, insert fake flash updates uh, to trigger social engineering attacks. Essentially, you can launch a whole range of attacks. So cross-site scripting is definitely very dangerous and definitely something you need to take into account. Before we talk about Angular, um, I'm going to make it a bit more painful for you guys. We're going to go back to the PHP uh, time. So back in the day, you wrote websites like this. So essentially, you had some data you want to put into the page. You do this on the server. It's going to render or generate some HTML, which you send to the browser, and the browser simply renders this. Um, if you know a bit about cross-site scripting, you see that there's probably um, something going wrong here. So essentially, when you have some data coming from the, from the URL, for example, my name, you generate this, and the browser does that. Um, when you insert some HTML there, um, the application will do this. The browser will actually uh, render the HTML. So when you insert something like this, which is the hook for beef, by the way, this hook.js file, when you insert this, the browser shows this. But in the background, the script will run, connect back to the command center, and start. Um, well, the attacker can start exploiting you. This is classic uh, textbook cross-site scripting. How do we prevent these things? What to do uh, to protect against that? Well, you should 
and go to your output. You should make sure when you uh, put something in the page that the browser will not mistake that for data. So essentially in PHP you had this HTML entities function, or you still have, and if you put a username through that, then the browser or the, the application will send this to the browser. When the browser is reading this, this will not be interpreted as code. It's uh, simply something that will render a tag like this, but it will not be interpreted as code. So if you have the, the beef hook here, it will not be picked up by the browser. Sounds simple enough, right? If it's so simple, why do we still have this problem today? Well, we have this problem today because it's not that simple. First of all, you have the username here, for example, but you, you also have it here. You have some color, you have some status, you have all of these variables everywhere in the page. You have thousands of outputs, and you need to cover each and every one of them. If you miss one, the attacker will find it, and you have a problem. That's problem number one. Second problem, if you look very closely, this is between HTML tags. This value sits within a, a CSS context, this value sits within an HTML attribute, and this value sits within a JavaScript context. All of these contexts essentially have special characters that are considered dangerous. In an HTML context, it's an open tag, but in a JavaScript context, if you can insert a double quote here, then uh, you're running JavaScript code and you can start doing whatever you want. And this means that for these uh, kinds of scenarios, you need context-sensitive output encoding functions. You need to make sure or de determine as a developer, what am I doing here? I'm putting a variable in JavaScript, so I should make sure that it's safe for JavaScript. I don't care about HTML, I care about JavaScript at that point. And that's why cross-site scripting or defending against cross-site scripting is so difficult. This problem actually exists in other places as well. Think about SQL injection. If you think about SQL injection, the ser well, you generate the SQL query, you give it to the database server, and the server is confused about what parts of the query are actually data and what parts of the query are actually code. And you probably know this comic that illustrates the problem very well. If you don't, look it up. It's called Bobby Tables, uh, and you'll have some fun. Uh, you can buy t-shirts with the comic and whatever you want. Why am I showing you this? Because the actual, well, the, the, the encoding of the, uh, the output is, is only part of the solution. It's, it's treating the symptoms. What would be better is if you avoid the confusion between data and code, then cross-site scripting goes away, essentially. And that's kind of what, what Angular does. If you have some familiarity with Angular, like uh, the first five seconds of the tutorial, you do something like this. I mean, you do something like that, essentially you're binding data into the template. So you're telling Angular, I'm going to put some data here. Please uh, put it into the template and show it to the user. So if you insert something like this, what's actually going to happen is this, and you're going to see that. Why? Well, Angular knows, it has loaded your template, it knows the, the data, it knows the code, and it knows you're going to put data in here. So it knows automatically, hey, that's potentially dangerous. I'm going to make sure that I encode this for the right context, because if it's code, then uh, I don't want the browser executing this. So this happens out of the box in Angular. Really cool. Um, same, same thing here. So let's say the, the problem here is, let's say you want to use the blink tag, which I don't advise, but let's say you really want to do this. Um, actually, Angular is going to say, no, 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 this is potentially dangerous. I don't know what's in here. I'm going to escape it anyway. I'm going to make sure that you're protected. But what if you want HTML? If you want HTML, there's a, a technique you can use, which is called sanitizing. And sanitizing is, instead of encoding something to be safe, it's going to analyze it and make sure that it's safe by taking out the dangerous parts. So essentially, if you bind something like this, this is Angular 2, um, essentially you're binding uh, HTML, so you're telling Angular, don't encode, but uh, make sure it's safe anyway. And Angular, if you do this, it's going to show the blink tag. Well, honestly, I haven't checked whether the blink tag is supported by Angular or not, but let's say it's not harmful, harmful so it's going to show or keep the HTML intact. But if you insert a script tag, for example, it's going to only uh, output this harmless part and it's going to strip out this dangerous part, which is a script tag. And by doing this, it ensures, or Angular ensures, that uh, the user or your input can contain harmless HTML but will not contain dangerous features. So if you, for example, in insert an image tag there, the image tag will be present, but if you have an on-error event handler, which is an inject injection vector, the on-error event handler will be stripped. And again, this happens in Angular 2, this happens out of the box. In Angular 1, you need to enable the ng-sanitize module, which is part of the core, um, but you need to do this explicitly. In Angular 2, this happens automatically, which is really, really cool. So essentially, um, the only thing you need to do is get out of the way. Let the sanitizer do what it does best, and don't try to mess, mess with it or screw it up or whatever. So essentially, in, in an Angular world, this means 
Don't call uh, low-level APIs directly. Don't start calling uh, browser DOM APIs directly because Angular is no longer in the loop at that point. So it will not be able to protect you and you will have vulnerabilities in your application. Same with uh, if you load something like jQuery, don't try to use jQuery directly unless you really know how to do it securely. Otherwise, you're going to bypass this protection and it's going to end up um, you're going to end up with vulnerabilities. Sometimes you will want to do something uh, unsecure uh, because you know it's actually secure, uh, but Angular is still uh, refusing to do so. And that's where you can use these uh, functions to mark something as, uh, as trusted. So in Angular 1, these functions were called trust as HTML, um, which was kind of a confusing name because people actually thought it was to make something trusted, which is not the case. So these functions simply tell Angular, don't touch this. I vouch for the fact that this is secure. Um, stay away from it. So they renamed the functions to, to bypass security, trust HTML in Angular 2. So essentially when you write that, uh, kind of a light should go on in your brain that, uh, hey, I'm doing something potentially insecure. Wh what am I doing here? You should go read the documentation and understand what's actually happening. If you don't, then I don't think there's much hope for you. But essentially, this brings me to the first takeaway of this talk. I have four, so um, we're only... Uh, only a quarter in. So essentially, Angular does a very good job in protecting you against cross-site scripting. So if you build Angular applications and you stick to the Angular paradigm of loading your application on the client side, fetching data, um, and using the data binding or the, the sanitization, um, you're essentially doing good. Uh, there's probably not going to be too much uh, cross-site scripting problems in your applications. So I have uh, a small recap of everything, so you can look at the slides later. You can find the slides on my, my Twitter feed. Uh, by the way, if you want to grab a copy um, for later reference. So, so far so good. At this point, we know what cross-site scripting is, we know um, how to deal with untrusted inputs. But what about the code that should be there? How can we control that? Is it trusted code or is it untrusted code? Well, if you have an application, the first thing you do is loading Angular. How do you know you're loading Angular? We're going to talk about that a bit. Once the application is loaded, you have user data, which is potentially untrusted, but you also have uh, external components, or you have a Twitter timeline or an advertisement that's also potentially untrusted. And I'm going to talk about a few techniques you can use to gain uh, more control about um, what's, what's going on there and how, how you can build a better and more secure application. First, let's talk about knowing what code you load. So essentially, when you load the Angular library, you do something like this. You include it from a CDN somewhere, um, and you, you tell the, the, the browser, essentially, fetch this file and load it for me. How do you know that this is an Angular library? The only thing you have to indicate that is a directory and a file name. So essentially, you're hoping that your file name will actually point to an Angular library. If somebody goes to the CDN and replaces that file with something else, um, you're going to probably load the malicious file, and your application is going to be vulnerable from the first second it starts loading. And this happens in practice. jQuery had a problem. They, uh, a couple of years ago, they actually hosted a, a jQuery file with malware in it. And you can imagine a lot of people load that file, so a lot of websites all of a sudden loaded malware and were uh, uh, targeting users uh, through there. So what, what can we do against this? Um, by the way, um, this, this is kind of obvious that it's malware. Of course, if you want to do this in real life, you uh, make a small modifications to a legitimate Angular library, so everything still works as before, only you get this uh, very additional piece of uh, code that does something more than you bargained for. But how can we protect against this? Well, there's actually a very cool mechanism, mechanism that you can use in uh, a lot of browsers today, and it's called sub-resource integrity. And sub-resource integrity is a fancy word for saying I want to make sure that if I load an external file, an external script file or style sheet, that it's actually the file that I wanted uh, and not something that has been modified afterwards. So you do this by uh, specifying a checksum. It's a SHA-384 SHA, uh, in this case. You have other algorithms as well. A checksum with the integrity attribute. So just like that, you can tell the browser, load this file with this file name, and I have calculated this checksum before, and it should be this. And if that's the case, then everything is fine. Otherwise, um, please run away as fast as you can. So this is what happens. You load the file, the browser gets the file, check, calculates the checksum, compares it to this, and if it matches, then the file has not been modified. Because to uh, attack this, the attacker would have to change this file, which would change the checksum, which is put in your application. So if he can change that, he has already compromised your application anyway. Of course, when the, the checksum doesn't match, the browser gives you an error and simply refuses to load the file. 
So let's say that the CDN gets hacked, this Angular library is replaced by a malicious one. Uh, the moment your application is loading, the browser simply says, no, I'm not going to load that Angular library. You can load a backup from somewhere else if you want, or host a backup file yourself, should that ever happen, that you can still load that if you want to. And essentially, that's it. Very, very simple. Very easy to deploy. It, it doesn't really impact your application, because in 99.9% .9 of the cases, everything works fine. But should something go wrong, you actually gain a lot of protection by this simple mechanism. Very powerful. And a lot of CDNs support this out of the box. So uh, when you copy these, these things to your application, you have this option, copy script tag with SRI, and you actually get this. So essentially, you get all of that uh, out of the box. You can also calculate this yourself. There's a website that uh, does this for you if you want. They also have the commands how you can do this on your command line uh, using uh, OpenSSL or whatever uh, library. And you can do this for your own application files by including this in your Webpack configuration as well. There's a, a plugin there that uh, you simply need to enable, and then during the build process, it will calculate the checksums of your files and put them in your, uh, your production files, which you can then uh, deploy on your uh, web server. So really powerful. Uh, support is quite good, so definitely uh, recommend it to do. Of course, in this case, if somebody attacks the CDN and is able to modify this code as well, then uh, you don't really get too much uh, out of this the first time you do this. So the moment you copy, you still need to trust the fact that the file or hope that the file is, is uh, not uh, compromised, uh, but afterwards you get all the protection uh, in the world, which is really cool. Browser support is, um, well, IE doesn't support this. Uh, the other ones uh, do, and hopefully, well, IE is not going to catch up, but Edge will hopefully start supporting this in the future as well, uh, especially because it's fairly simple and really powerful. Brings me to the second takeaway. And the takeaway here is that, uh, well, honestly, you should start enabling sub-resource integrity. It's really trivial to do. Um, it doesn't take too much work and it buys you uh, a lot of assurances. So uh, this is definitely something to put on your list uh, to look at and to start uh, solving. Again, here's a small overview to take away home with you. So now we know that the code that we have loaded is actually the code we wanted. But how can we make sure that the code still behaves as we expect or that we can restrict it in somehow? some way. Or let's say that we still have a cross-site scripting attack factor, that something still goes wrong at some point. How can we make sure that it's a bit limited in its power and we can kind of restrain it? Again, there's a security feature for that. Security feature is called content security policy. Who here has heard of content security policy before? Oh, two guys. Okay. It's really good that you're all here. That's, that's awesome. Content security policy is actually um, a really complicated policy. Um, I'm, I'm not kidding. It's actually quite complicated because it does. Uh, it gives you a lot of control over the content that is loaded in your web pages. I'm going to talk about the part that protects uh, or that helps you protect against uh, script-based attacks, but it also gives you control about where images can come from, where style sheets can be loaded from, where uh, where XHR connections can be made to uh, WebSocket connections. There's a lot of stuff in there. It started out um, four or five years ago, and it uh, they're currently working on version three. So they're adding new features, they're uh, making it uh, compatible with uh, as many applications as possible, so uh, you don't have to spend too much effort to enable this. I'm going to talk about a subset. If you want to know more, um, there's plenty of information available online. There's uh, information on my website on how to deploy CSP, um, so you can definitely find uh, a lot of stuff there. But content security policy, or CSP in short. CSP is essentially delivered uh, with a response header. That's the default way. You can also do it with a meta tag in, in certain cases, but that's uh, not recommended unless you want to do something really special. So in general, you have this response header with a policy. And a policy here says script SRC self. And essentially, that's CSP language for, for telling the browser, if you load a script, uh, you're only allowed to load scripts from my own origin. So if I'm website.be, you can only load scripts from website.be. Somebody tries to load something from evil, evil whatever .com, don't do it. It's not mine. I have not whitelisted this, so just stay away from it and refuse to do so. That's what you get with this policy. There's two additional restrictions that CSP enables by default to protect you against the injection of dangerous content. The first restriction is the, the, one, I, uh, well, the one I explained. So you have this whitelist that needs to be honored. So if you want to load this, that's not in the whitelist. It's going to be refused. The second restriction is inline scripts are blocked, and they will not execute. Why? Because if you have uh, a vulnerability where somebody can inject this and you block this, then you can also inject something like that, um, which would still result in a cross-site scripting attack. 
Um, and that's uh, why inline scripts are also blocked by CSP. You can imagine, if you think back to our really old PHP application, you can imagine if you start blocking stuff like this, or the on-click handler, or whatever, it's going to break a lot. And that's exactly what happened with the first version of CSP. So they proposed this, then they, uh, well, in, in a very isolated world, this works quite fine, and then they started uh, testing this on real-world applications, and they saw that this is, this is a nightmare. This is um, impossible to refactor your code to support this uh, easily. So they started uh, changing CSP and adding features to support this. But let's take a look at Angular. Will it work with Angular? What do you think? Well, let's take a look. Here's a very simple example of Angular. What we do here is we load some resources in the index page, and then we start the Angular application. Uh, we have an inline script block here. If you enable a policy like this, we get a lot of errors. This is the, the traditional case with CSP. You, you enable CSP, and the first thing is your application breaks completely, and you get a huge list of errors in the browser. And that's the moment that most people turn it off again and do something else. Uh, well, I'm going to show you that it's, uh, it looks a lot worse than it actually is, and it's uh, not that uh, tricky to uh, deal with these uh, kind of things. If you look closely, it's complaining that we're loading files from the CDN at Cloudflare. And it's uh, essentially, uh, it's for the jQuery's code and uh, the bootstrap code, which we are uh, loading here in, compl in complementary to our Angular application. So one easy way is to simply whitelist this. So if you would add this CDN to the whitelist, these errors go away, because now CSP is checking, hey, a script file, oh, but it's in the whitelist, that's okay, so I'm going to load that file. Easy enough, right? Well, of course, if you have a real application, you, got, you have a lot of dependencies, so it, it's going to be a bit more complicated, but that should essentially solve most of these problems. That's how people were building CSP policies for four to five years, uh, until last summer when uh, the Google guy said, like, yeah, um, that's all fun uh, and, and it might work, but it's actually not very secure. So they did some research and apparently you can uh, load some crazy things from CDNs. If you whitelist the whole CDN, people can inject something that's whitelisted by the CSP policy that will give them the power to essentially execute code. It's crazy stuff like injecting a flash file and then give it some data which a flash file will run as code and there's a few bypasses, the, the full link is here, so it's a full paper, you can read it, it's, uh, it's an interesting read. But essentially it turns out that host-based whitelisting is a very bad idea. They made a tool, CSP Evaluator, where you can uh, evaluate your policy and it's going to tell you like the things that you should not be doing. By the way, it only uh, checks the script uh, SRC directive. So what, what should you be doing? If, if this is a bad idea, um, how can we solve this? Well, you should be whitelisting these things with uh, nonce. And the nonce here essentially tells, um, well, it's, it's a random value, so it's not super random, it's actually a random value um, that uh, is put into the policy and it's also put into the page. And if you do it like that, then uh, the browser will check, hey, it's a script, script tag here, it has a nonce, it's the same nonce as in the header, so I'm going to load this file and it's fine. No need for whitelisting. Uh, of course, nonsense must be fresh and random, so um, if you generate the page again or load the page again, it should have a different nonce, but you can easily uh, use static string replacements in HTML pages to fix something like that. Um, and that's essentially um, a very cool improvement. There's going to be a second improvement in the next version of CSP where you don't need to use nonsense, but you can also use hashes. So you can calculate a hash of this jQuery file, which is kind of static, should be static, like sub-resource integrity, and then you can put a hash in the policy as well, and you don't need to use the fresh and random nonsense. And the cool thing about nonsense is it also works for inline script blocks. So you can add a nonce here, and this tells the browser, hey man, this nonce has been put here by the developer, otherwise uh, the value will never match the value in the header, and uh, you can whitelist that inline script block. Sounds, again, easy enough. And it is easy in an isolated world. But once you want to load uh, a Twitter timeline, um, it's a bit more tricky. Because you can whitelist the first uh, piece of Twitter code. Twitter has like this snippet of code you have to put into a website, and then it does all of kinds of crazy stuff, which eventually renders this timeline. And if you do it like this, it's going to break. Because you can nonce this first part, but then Twitter needs access to all of these other uh, services to load information and to fetch the tweets and to fetch the images in the tweets. And it's, it's a mess, uh, believe me. I've, I've been there a couple of times. Um, you need to, uh, this is a cascading effect. So you load the first thing, it breaks, gives you some errors, you whitelist it, you do it again and again until everything works, and then you hope that Twitter doesn't change anything, otherwise it starts breaking again. So this is the point um, last summer that Google also said, we tried to deploy CSP, uh, but we have a lot of uh, these dependencies. This doesn't work for us. We cannot go over this, uh, go through this over and over again 
and uh, fix this, uh, this policy over and over again. And that's why they came up with uh, a new feature called Strict Dynamic. And Strict Dynamic essentially tells the browser, if I have whitelisted a script to be loaded in my page, I, I implicitly trust this script because it runs in my page. It can do whatever it wants anyway. So why not allow it to load additional files? I'm going to have to whitelist this anyway because I have put a script in there myself. So this strict dynamic keyword means if a script block has been loaded or whitelisted with a nonce in this case, uh, everything it additional it loads, it's going to be allowed by default. And that's how you can include this Twitter timeline by nonsing this, uh, this, if the Twitter code would be here, by nonsing this block, and then the strict dynamic will uh, check, oh, if Twitter wants to load additional script code, it does this in, in a secure way, it's not injected, okay, that's fine, I'm going to allow this to happen. And that actually makes CSP a lot more useful. Um, there's a small, well, it's a bit less secure than before, so uh, don't use strict dynamic if you don't need it, but if you need it, it makes it uh, at least manageable to deploy CSP. And if you deploy a policy like this, <coughs> of course, uh, in, a, in a real CSP policy, you want to use additional features than only the script SRC. But this is an example of how uh, backwards compatibility can be built into a CSP policy. So if you deploy a policy like this, um, modern browsers like uh, Chrome and uh, Safari, what they will see is um, they will ignore certain things in the policy. So they will see, especially here, the nonce. They recognize that because of the nonce. Well, I'm not going to talk about that, sorry. And they recognize a strict dynamic. And strict dynamic uh, causes it to ignore the whitelist. And the whitelist here is actually a wide open whitelist. Every HTTPS and every HTTP resource is whitelisted. But Chrome ignores it anyway, so it doesn't matter. So this is actually, um, this allows you to nonce scripts and it uh, allows the scripts to load additional resources. So it protects against remote script injections and against inline script injections. That's good. If you have another browser, like Safari, Opera, or Edge, um, essentially, um, they don't know strict dynamic yet. Um, they will in the future, but uh, it's still in development. Uh, so they d haven't implemented support for that yet. So they will actually use the, the wide open whitelist here. So this means that you no longer have protection against uh, an injection that loads additional remote scripts, but you still have protection against uh, inline scripts if you use it like that. And of course, you have IE. Um, you have nothing there, but you also don't break anything. So that's kind of the backwards compatibility. This thing protects you um, in, in this scenario, protects you a little bit here, but at least it doesn't break. And that's the main uh, takeaway here uh, of this policy. Again, read the full paper, and there's a, a recorded talk of the Google guys explaining this um, if you want to know more. Brings me to the third takeaway. And the third takeaway here is that CSP actually gives you the power to lock your application down. Like I said, CSP, you can do it for scripts, but you can also do it for uh, flash files, uh, you can do it for um, images, for XHR requests. So essentially you can um, closely specify this is the allowed behavior and everything that falls outside of that scope, uh, you should prevent that from happening. So in case something goes wrong, the browser will be able to protect you. And that's actually uh, really, really powerful. Again, the takeaway to take home. There's one thing I haven't mentioned yet. Um, my apologies for that. You can also see this additional uh, directive here, report URI, and then the URL. What this thing does, I, ha I forgot to mention, what this thing does is you can tell the browser, if you see a violation, you, of course the browser shows this in a developer console, but the user doesn't see it and is definitely not going to report this. With this, you can tell the browser, send me a report at this endpoint. Please sell, send me a JSON report saying what has been blocked and why, uh, so I can at least analyze whether I forgot to put something in my policy, whether somebody injected something and I need to find out where it's coming from and how it got there. Uh, but this is actually quite powerful to get insights in what's happening on the client side uh, in your application context. You can run your own uh, coll uh, report collection endpoint. It's not, it's simply a, a, an endpoint that accepts a JSON report, so it's not that difficult. Of course, run it on a separate server than your main application, so you don't, do not get DDoSed by your reports. Um, but you can also use, there's a free service called reporturi.io, which can re collect reports for you if you want to. Again, a very nice feature of CSP. So, three takeaways. I have one left. CSP allows you to define where content is loaded from. But it doesn't really restrict behavior. So once content is loaded, it can still do whatever it wants, more or less. And that's uh, what, what the last part is going to be about. How can you restrict content in your application? Very good example, Steam. I think half a year ago, Steam had um, this nasty cross-site scripting injection problem. 
So they, they allow you to edit your profile page, and essentially they forgot that they probably should uh, protect that uh, data when it's uh, echoed back to a user. So you could put whatever you wanted in here, and it will trigger script execution. And that's a problem. Of course, we have seen the traditional defenses against these kind of things, but is there something you can do more? Is there more, or is there a way to isolate that uh, obviously untrusted piece of data in your application? So in case something goes wrong, in case somebody finds a bypass anyway, um, it will not be able to affect the rest of your uh, main application. And there is, actually. And it's, um, it's called a sandbox, an iframe sandbox. This is, part from H uh, this is introduced in HTML5, so it's actually um, quite old already. It's five, six years, something like that. And essentially, when you specify an iframe, um, where you load a snippet of code, uh, you can essentially put the sandbox attribute there. And if you do it like that, the browser will enforce a lot of restrictions on that specific iframe. So by default, this code runs in a unique origin. So even if something malicious happens in here, it will never be able to reach into the parent page because it's a unique origin. It's not the same as the parent page. By default, there's no script execution in the iframe. Boom, no injection vectors, done. There's no form submissions because somebody may inject a fake form and the user may be uh, confused about which form is the actual login form and fill out the wrong form and submit a credential somewhere, but the form will not be submitted in the iframe. Boom, no navigations. There's no plugin content, no, no uh, Java applets, no flash files in the iframe. Yay. Um, there's no full screen capabilities and no autoplay. So essentially, there's a lot of restrictions on this uh, sandboxed iframe. So this is ideal to put untrusted data. If you know that you have a piece of data that's directly coming from the user, uh, please use the sandbox uh, on an iframe if you can, because even if something goes wrong, you will be protected by the browser, which is really, really awesome. Of course, this is kind of uh, very restrictive. Uh, you can re-enable a lot of these things. So there are keywords to say, you can say sandbox equals allow scripts. You get everything from before, except scripts can be executed now. So uh, again, if you have a piece of un untrusted content, but you still need to execute some scripts, put it in here. Um, even if something goes wrong, it will be constrained to this sandbox, um, and it will not be able to break out of that um, into the parent page or sibling context or whatever. Two things that cannot be lifted, uh, plugin content cannot be re-enabled, so uh, there will never ever be Flash or Java in a sandbox, which is a good thing uh, if you're doubt doubting uh, that. And um, there's also some restrictions on uh, navigation, so certain uh, navigations like the are not allowed. Fair warning, if you re-enable features, don't re-enable allow same origin and allow scripts together, because if you do that, then the sandbox can run script code, but it's running in the same origin as the parent page, so it can uh, reach out to the parent page and again start doing whatever it wants. So once you do that, this code can actually easily break out of its own sandbox and again do whatever it wants. So use one or the other, but never ever uh, both of these uh, together. This is in the spec, by the way, but we all know how it goes. People read Stack Overflow and not the specification, and they might miss this, uh, so that's why I explicitly mention it here. But back to Angular, how do you use this in practice? Well, let's say if you have an Angular application, there's Angular application, there's actually three um, ways to, to um, embed this, this kind of a sandbox. The first one is you can uh, simply um, put, a, put a route here and uh, sandbox it. And essentially what that will do is that will um, trigger a navigation in the sandbox and it will um, be picked up by an Angular application. But these are isolated contexts, so this means that in the sandbox, a new Angular context will be bootstrapped. So you're essentially you're running um, two Angular instances. You're running one in the outer page and one in the inner page. This may not be a problem if you have one iframe. If you have like 100, that's probably not the most efficient way of doing things. Um, so there's alternatives there uh, as well. You can simply um, use a static HTML file and put that in the sandbox. If you don't need uh, the a full Angular context here, if you simply need to display some data, you can easily put the static data in the sandbox uh, and do it like that. And if you want to get rid of the page load, you can even use SRCDoc. SRCDoc is an attribute also in HTML5 that allows um, you to specify a snippet of, uh, of HTML code uh, right there in the attribute, and it will put that code into the sandbox. So no page loads, simply HTML loaded directly into this uh, sandbox. So, plenty of options, but um, like, like I said, this is an isolated context. How do you communicate? What if you're actually running something dynamic in here and you need to exchange some data or load some data or do something dynamic? Well, this is no longer an option. There's no way for you to reach into the frame. If you do it like this, you get a, a browser warning because, like I said, the sandbox runs in a unique origin. The sandbox is separated from the main page, 
so it will not be able, or you will not be able to reach into that sandbox directly. You should be using um, web messaging for that. Uh, web messaging uh, is probably better known as post message. Um, it's a mechanism to send messages between contexts. It's a subscribe-based mechanism. So unless uh, the context you're sending a message who subscribes to receiving messages, it will not see the message. So if you want to send a message, you get a reference to the context, and you simply, uh, well, you have the window here. You can call post message with a message or an object or whatever. You can share objects as well if you want. Copy them, not, uh, not the same object. Uh, you can send it like this. And you can receive messages by subscribing to this message event listener, and you can um, get the message data here. The reason I'm going into this is because there's two security uh, things I need to mention. First of all, if you receive a message, always check where the message is coming from. There's one uh, channel for sending messages, and you don't know where the message is coming from. So if you have, uh, it can be from a browser extension, it can be from a different context. So always check, um, is this from the context I expect the message to be from? If that's the case, then you can process it however you want. Um, if it's not, then you should discard it or handle it uh, appropriately. Of course, uh, take into account, I've seen chat applications that use this mechanism. Um, this is data. If you ins insert that in an insecure way into the DOM, then you still have cross-site scripting, by the way. So uh, this is something you need to think about when you do it like that. Second aspect, normally when you send a message, you should specify the origin where it's going to, to avoid um, some weird attacks where the message is sent to a frame and the frame is uh, navigated at the same time and the message would end up with a different page than you intended. So you should specify it here. The problem is a sandbox has a unique origin. So there's nothing to specify. You don't know what the origin is, and you need to use a wildcard there. That's uh, a drawback of using the mechanism like this, um, but that's um, unfortunately the way it is. It's, it's a very small attack factor, so, so you shouldn't worry about it, but I just wanted to give you, uh, or point, point out that you should use the wildcard there to get it right. And browser support is actually quite good. Oh, crap, that's the wrong screenshot. Um, my apologies. Browser support is actually quite good. So um, I don't think IE supports it, but all the other browsers uh, do. So um, I'll have to update the slides on my website, but I will do that right after the talk. So Sandbox is supported by all major browsers today, which is a very good thing. And like, I, uh, like the other ones, this is a quick wrap up of um, what this actually means if you want to uh, refer back to that later. And that kind of brings me to the conclusion of this talk. Um, I'm going to quickly reiterate over the takeaways. So sandboxing, very, very powerful mechanism to isolate untrusted code. So if you have a piece of code or data or whatever that you know is untrusted by default, please put it in a sandbox if you can. Comments on a blog post, prime candidate, put it in a sandbox with SRC doc or whatever, um, but make sure that it's isolated in case something goes wrong. With CSP, you can decide or define what uh, your application, what resources can be loaded, and what outgoing connections can be made. And again, this is a very powerful mechanism that allows you to lock it down. So it, you have a wide range of possibilities, and with CSP you can narrow it down to the set that you actually need, and everything else will be blocked by default. With SRI, you can define upfront which files you expect, and you should do this. So you should tell the browser, um, I'm going to load these files, this is a file name, but look at the checksum. If the checksum matches, this is the file I intended to load. If it doesn't, um, something fishy is going on, and um, I'm potentially, um, well, you're protecting your application if that is the case. And then finally, cross-site scripting-wise in Angular, um, get out of the way and don't try to work against Angular, meaning don't use low-level APIs. Don't mix Angular with a PHP application, so don't do half of your page rendering on the server and half of it on the client side, it's going to end very badly. So stick to Angular, stick to the paradigm. Um, don't use bypass security without thinking about it. Uh, don't turn the sanitizer off. Uh, unfortunately, there's people that think that that's a good idea. Don't do it. And simply uh, let Angular do the work for you. Like I said in the beginning when I introduced myself, I'm a trainer, so I can tell you how to do it. Um, I can do it myself, but I don't build applications that millions of people use. You guys do. So it's up to you to actually build secure applications. So that's step number one, starting from, well, let's face it, probably uh, after the meeting read, it's going to be starting next week. You have to build more secure applications. That's action point number one. Action point number two is uh, make sure you're up to date about these changes in security. The last five years, we have seen numerous new security features in the browser. Um, I know it's a lot of information. It's hard to keep up. 
I try to provide um, some very um, well high level information that uh, gives you the right priorities, but there's other people that do this as well. So follow a few security people on Twitter or on LinkedIn or wherever on a mailing list to make sure that you're up to date with security. And most importantly, share. Events like this are great. If you do something security-wise, if you implement some of these feature features, why not submit a talk next year and come back here and explain what you did and how you did it? Um, and don't be afraid of making a mistake if somebody points out, hey, but uh, did you think about that? And if you haven't, well, you want to know about it and you want to fix it, right? So definitely share this internally in your company on meetups, on events like this, um, so other people can get inspired and can do the right thing as well. That's everything I had here today. Um, we still have some time to answer questions if you want to. Um, so thanks for listening and speak up if you have some questions. Yes. How do you prevent uh, computer machine exposure in uh, Angular applications? For example, like uh, business security rules that are used if they are trying to go to, uh, to, uh, to differentiate the behavior uh, when the UI is used. How do you uh, manage the, uh, the exposure of this information uh, to an attacker, for example? Okay, so um, I'll repeat the question in case it wasn't clear. So, how do you prevent the disclosure of information uh, on the client side if you put business rules or security rules in your Angular application? So, you're thinking about which parts are accessible to whom and, and things like that? Specifically, for example, when you manage a security role or stuff like that, you can go to disturb the security hierarchy of your role and uh, information like that. Yeah. That's actually. Um, a good question. There, there's no effective way of doing that. Um, that's, that's kind of a problem with client-side uh, security. Well, it, it depends on what kind of information. So first of all, all of these decisions on the client side, especially access control, doesn't buy you any security. It's simply usability. So you can tell the user, hey, you're not allowed to do this, or simply not show the option if the user is not allowed. That improves the UI. Uh, of course, the downside is you have to disclose that information to the client, so also to an attacker. Um, I would say if it's really sensitive and you don't want to leak that, um, find a way of modifying or uh, optimizing the UI without disclosing that information. Uh, it's probably going to be more coarse-grained than you would be able to do otherwise. But in most cases, I, I don't think it matters too much um, that you leak that information, as long as you actually enforce that on the server side as well. So that's rule number one. Always enforce these access control checks also on the server side, and then you can mimic them in your Angular applications to, to keep your UI um, as clean as possible um, without having to show access denied all the time when something happens. Anybody else? There, there's like a really bright light so I can see the back of the room, but yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so you talked today about the Angular mostly. From your experience, the other JavaScript framework has the security aware, security first, like the React, the JS, the Angular, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's more than Yeah, okay. Um, good, good question. So wh what about the other JavaScript frameworks? Um, that, that's kind of a loaded question. Um, there's me, and there's 10,000 frameworks. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I have looked um, at Ember.js, uh, which is kind of a, a one of the smaller ones, but actually I, I like it a lot. Um, that one is, is also, it, it has similar features. And I, I'm quite confident that most of them, at least the big ones, will have similar features as Angular does. And the reason they have these features is because now they can um, make that decision for you. PHP, well, uh, actually server-side frameworks have something similar. If you use something like Timeleaf, it also already knows where you're outputting data and it's going to try to protect you automatically. But an old PHP application had no idea what you're doing. So it had no idea to enforce this uh, cross-site scripting protection automatically. And now, with these Angular applications, we do. And with an Ember applications, we, ha we have the same. And with React, React also knows what you're doing, so it's going to be able to protect you against that as well. Um, so yes, I would say that the bigger ones um, are probably okay. Um, I haven't looked at it myself, so I, I cannot be 100% sure. Um, of course, if your neighbor writes one or you have one that's, uh, that's the very first version, um, you, you may want, want to check, uh, check that before, um, before starting to use that. Anybody else? Yes. Yes, you also have it in Angular 1. So um, 
That's actually one of my older talks. So cross-site request forgery, um, in, in a nutshell, for people not familiar with the problem, in, in CSERF, which is the short version for cross-site request forgery, CSERF, um, what's going on is um, a specific context in the browser makes a request to your backend, and uh, the browser will automatically attach cookies. And if the backend doesn't check where is this request coming from, it may treat a request coming from um, evil.com as a legitimate request um, and process it uh, as a legitimate request, which is kind of a problem. And you need to deploy defenses to make sure that the request actually comes from your application and not from somewhere else. Angular has enables this kind of behavior by default, um, but it can only do something useful with it if your backend um, offers that protection. So uh, the defenses against CSERF are server-side defenses, but you need uh, client-side support to make them work. And Angular supports one of these mechanisms uh, out of the box. Um, if you look on my website, there's a slide deck explaining how that works. Uh, and there's a probably a recording from that, I think from DevOps Friends, that I covered it there, I, I believe. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Maybe not on DevOps. I, I do so many talks; it's hard to keep them <laughs> keep them uh, organized in my head. But I, I have covered it somewhere, and it's it's recorded. So yes, um, that's an important part. Um, but you need to enable this on the server side. Of course, when you have an API, it becomes a bit more complex whether you actually need it or not. So it, CSERF only is only relevant with cookies. That's number one. And if you only have um, an API that's accessible through cores and not through normal HTTP requests, then you're also uh, fine if you check the origin header. Anything else? It's time for beer, probably. It's a national holiday here, right? It's yeah. Tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow. Okay. Awesome. All right. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Sorry, I. <laughs> okay, so the question was. Um, are all browsers kind of secure, or is, are, are some browsers more secure than others? Um, that, that is a really broad question. Uh, you, you can look at it at various different ways. Um, how am I going to answer that? Um, it depends. Um, honestly, in general, all the mainstream browsers are, are good. So. You, ha you have different levels of security. You have like the basic browser security, which is kind of the same origin policy, at least for web applications, it's the same origin policy. Um, cookies, local storage, these things, it's, it's, that's good in, in every browser. And if something breaks there, it's going to be fixed immediately. That's one, of one set of problems. Next, you have all of these new features. Um, obviously, well, we've seen this with uh, the browser support. The newer ones like Chrome and Firefox are typically ahead of the pack. They, they try some experimental stuff. They implement new things. Of course, when something changes, um, they, they'll have to adapt their implementation. Um, Safari and Opera are WebKit-based. They're typically following closely there, um, a bit slower, but uh, doing a good job. IE um, is, 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 well, IE, well, Edge, sorry, is, is a bit um, different. They, they seem to keep an eye out for the things that actually stick and are popular, are adopted by web applications before they make an effort of implementing support for them, which is, it, it's, well, it makes sense, that choice. Um, of course, that me this means that they are a bit slower. But most of these features are backwards compatible with browsers that don't support it. So you can still enable it for the users with a decent browser, and then uh, Edge users will get the same protection uh, once the features are implemented there as well. But in general, nothing will break. And then you have all, uh, these, all of these other as aspects um, of, of system level security and exploits in browsers and breaking out of the browser, and um, I have no idea how these things work. So. I, I know about the major cases, but I'm, I'm not a low-level guy, so uh, you'll have to find someone else for that. Uh. Okay. Thank you very much. If you still have another question, I'll be uh, here for a bit, so you can come talk to me afterwards um, and enjoy the, the party afterwards, I would say.